Hello and again, welcome to another edition of Online Ragamuffin. We're grateful and thankful that you are here with us again, joining us today. Uh, with me is my crew. Uh, I got Tom here to my right. Say hi, Tom. Hi. Got Alex to my left. Hey. And over flying solo, Krista White. Hi. Hi. And today, uh, we and this week, we're actually talking about um, it's not really controversial, but it tends to be probably one of the most controversial topics when it comes to Christianity. And uh, when we look at millennials um, specifically, it's one of the main reasons uh, why a lot of millennials have left the church uh, due to a lot of unanswered questions. And that is unanswered questions over uh, the Bible. Uh, what it says, what it means, what it stands for why we believe it, and things like that. And so today we're actually going to talk about God's Word, uh, the Bible, and, and three different aspects of it. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to ask you guys, um, you know, as, uh, what, what's your experience with God's Word? Has it been uh, something that you've had to struggle through, be like, it's so boring, but I read it anyway because we're supposed to? Is it something that's really come alive to you, and you're just like, I can't get enough of it? Um, is it something that's maybe confusing to you or do you have like questions that it's just frustrating because you can't ever find the answers to? What's kind of your experience? I've definitely struggled reading the Bible. I mean, I was growing up that you have to read it, everything like that, but I've had times when I'm like, I don't really want to read this, but I'll open it up and I'll read some and times like that, nothing really speaks to me. It's just, I'm reading it because I feel like I have to. But there's other times where I'll just sit down and be like, you know what, like I want to do this right now. And that's when stuff will like come out and talk to me and I'll be on the same like two verses for like 30 minutes to an hour, just like going deeper and deeper into it. So I think it depends on how much I want to go into it that I get out of it too. I feel like it has been a struggle for me um, because I know that God's word is living and active and it should speak to me. and. You know, I pray before I read God's Word and thinking that, like, I really want something to come out and speak to me, and it just doesn't always speak to me like I would like it to or think that it should. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I struggle with that too. Um, especially, like, when I'm not, like, at times in my life when I'm not as close to God as I should be. It's kind of like I just don't feel like reading it or I just don't feel like I'm getting anything out of it, but... I think when I am closer, that's when I'm like, it does seem like it's more alive to me, like really, and it just makes like, much more impact on my life when I'm reading it at that time. Yeah. I think for me, what's really frustrating is when you meet people um, who are like so gun ho about the Bible, like they never talk about the struggles that they have with it. They always talk about how great it is and how every time they open it, it's like magic happens and and for me, that, that tends to frustrate, frustrate me a little bit too because I don't think anybody um, is, is super um, enthralled with the Bible 100% of the time. It's one of those things like, kind of like what Alex said, um, you know, there are times where it feels alive to you and then there are times where it feels just totally dusty and dead. And um, today I just really want to talk a little bit about that. Um, and Tom, you brought it up um, a little bit. A verse out of out of Hebrews chapter four, uh, it just kind of gives us an understanding of, of the word of God, and it says um, in Hebrews four twelve, for the word of God is living and active, and it's sharper than a double edged sword, penetrating uh, to separate soul and spirit and joint and marrow, and it, is, it it judges the attitude and the thoughts of our hearts. All right, and when we read that verse, we see uh, three specific things going on there. And the first thing is that the Word of God is living and active. What do you think that means? It means, I guess it means that it's not a normal book that like any other book that you would pull off the shelf and read. It's just, just what is written there, but it's living and active in the sense that the Spirit of God will teach you things out of it that um, you might not get otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with what he says. And I also think like you could take it as in it's living and active like 
still today. Because there's people that will be like, that was written so long ago, like it's not present. But no, it's still living and active like in today's world. Like you can take everything from it and still. I mean, it's still living and active. Like you, yeah. you can still use it. Yeah, and that's pretty interesting too about the Bible. I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, it's almost like any situation you could ever have in life, the Bible has an answer for it. Yeah. You know, and if you're struggling in school, the Bible has some answer for you to help you get through school. And, and uh, you know, if, if, if it's an attitude issue, the Bible's got answers for your attitude. If it's a work-related issue, it's got answers. So it's very relevant to everything uh, that we, we are a part of today. And so a lot of people will say, you know, it's just outdated. That's, that's something for 2,000 years ago. There's no need for that now. Reality, it's again live and active, and and for today. What do you think, Alex? What do you think living and active means? Yeah, I think that kind of just like what they were saying, um, and how like like it's still God speaking to us just as much as He's speaking to anyone else in the past. I mean, not even necessarily even two thousand years, but even with back like five hundred years. You know, it's still it's speaking to everyone since that time. That you know, yeah. anybody can pick something out of it for their daily life. Indeed. I think that I look back over the last 10 years of my life um, and all the major decisions that I've made as an adult, I've made by consulting with you know, the Word of God, by getting in my Bible. Uh, there was a point in time about eight years ago where I decided to go in, in, uh, in a business adventure and I was really unsure about what I should do and uh, what I was meant to do with this whole business aspect and so uh, I took time and I, I got down and I prayed. And, and I was looking in, in God's Word, I was like, Lord, I need a word from you uh, to really show me what I'm supposed to do uh, with this business. And, um, you know, my heart just started feeling prompted to go to a certain scripture. And I found that scripture, and, and man, it was just confirmation. And I started doing that business, and um, it w had to do with, uh, with, with nutrition products. And I was able to help so many people, just like God said I was going to in that verse. And it was just affirmation for me. Same thing happened when I got married. When I met my wife, I went on this prayer retreat and I brought my Bible with me and had a flashlight and all night long, I'm just reading through scripture as my heart is feeling prompted to go. And, and man, by the end of that night, I knew without any shadow of any doubt that I was supposed to marry my wife because the Lord had, had brought that affirmation to me through his word. And so can you guys think of a specific time where you needed a guidance and direction from the Lord and, and you needed an answer? And, and the Lord brought it uh, to you through his word. I do it a lot, like with almost everything. Google is my friend and I will Google like, if I'm dealing with, for finals I did, so stress with finals, I was like dealing with stress. Typed into Google, I was like Bible verse dealing with stress. It'd give you like 10 or whatever. And then I'd go straight to that. Or like with relationships, I'd be like, Bible verses to help me with this. And it would help me with that. Like. I'm pretty sure I use it for everything. <laughs> but the one that I probably use it most for is like stress or even reconnecting with the Lord. Cause I, you mentioned earlier how there's times that you're like not feeling it as much as other times. And when I notice that I'm not like, not 100%, I'll like try and go in there and I'll specifically be like, all right, like help me, help me get back on track. I guess my experience might be a little bit different, and I have prayed for very clear direction in decisions at times. Um, I, I really don't feel like I've ever got specific direction. I've got some framework type thing. Um, like in my life, I've been praying about like what I need to do for work or whatever at times, and I've felt that I need to learn to be content, um, but not, not like a very specific direction, like you need to do this job um, right now and you're going to help these people um, just to, in general you need to learn to be content um, but it doesn't what you're specifically doing doesn't really matter but that's that's been my experience I, I really have not felt um, super clear specific direction I think for me it was uh, a couple times I've gone on uh, my mission trips uh, you know I felt like there was confirmation through scripture that I was supposed to go um, and then the specific place I was supposed to go, I felt like God put people in my life to confirm that that's where I was supposed to go. And like, even just like scriptures that I would read, that put me at peace, that I knew this is 
God, you know, totally telling me that I you know, need to do this. And so I think that was, for me, that's how it was. That's good. That's good. And so the first part of that verse, and talk about being living and active, um, the, the middle part of that verse says that, you know, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it divides soul and spirit, and divides joint and marrow. And I think that um, as you study that verse, what it, what it really begins to say to us is that the Word of God um, separates what is true from what is false. And I think that there are a lot of times, uh, especially in society today, we're dealing with so many issues, um, be it political issues, be it uh, social issues, uh, be it even just every day how to live life, um, like moral issues. And everyone's got an opinion and everyone's got, um, you know, this, this idea of what they think right is. And man, you start, you start um, bringing up how the Bible is true and the Bible is absolute truth and it really stirs some arguments. I bet if you went to school and started having conversations with any one of your professors about that, that's going to stir up some, stir up some debate, stir up some arguments. And with that said, you know the, the Bible. Um, this is probably the one area where it is most difficult for um, people your age, this millennial generation, uh, to really grasp onto, uh, because we are uh, we are a generation of we want to know the facts. Give us the hard cold facts. Uh, but the reality is is that when you give a, a statement like that, like the Bible is absolutely true. And when you give a statement that has a claim of a bar so high, what ends up happening is, is it's hard to really accept that. How can I know it's true? How do I know that this book that's thousands of years old, how can I know that it's going to be true? What makes your religion better than other people's religion? Um, and how can you tell me that that truth, uh, that the truth that you're saying is so real? Like, how can I understand that? Because to me, it sounds like bigotry. To me, it sounds like racism. To me, it sounds like hate. Um, how can that be true? So, how do you how do you help, um, or how do you yourself understand this idea of truth, understanding what is true versus what is false? Um, in God's word, like how is God's word a standard of truth for you? Is it something that you uh, just accept by faith, or is it something that's been proven to you through, um, you know, conversations and understanding and studying? How do you understand um, the Bible to be truth, or do you understand the Bible to be truth? I'm going to be honest, there's parts of the Bible that I still question, like today, that I've yeah. read over, over, and over, and over again, and I will probably still question them, just because of how I was raised and stuff like that. I mean, I believe it, but it's, like, to another extent where I just question it. Like, there's nothing in the Bible that I will, like, just, like, this is unimportant. Like, whoever, this is crazy. We don't need this part in the Bible. Like. No matter what it is, it has something to tell us. And I think a lot of the Bible that has this something to tell us is I try and focus on, okay, so maybe I question these exact words, but what can I take another step further? So, I mean, I think the whole Bible, like, I believe in the whole Bible. There's just parts of it that I, like, I have to figure out still. But figure it out. Well, I think it's good. I don't know that I really ever sat down and really considered um, whether I truly believe all of the Bible is true. That was something growing up that like I was taught from being a little kid. So it's one of those truths that I guess I never even thought about whether it was true because I was always told that like, yeah, the Bible is God's word and it's 100% true and it's completely accurate. Um, but when it comes right down to it, do I actually... Um, believe that on a level that's not just well I've always been told that so it's what I believe I I guess I don't I don't know that I've really sat down and ever questioned that and until you question something I don't know that you'll ever make it to the point that you truly believe it 
So mm -hmm. I guess I've never even questioned it. Yeah. But. Now, Alex, you went to a uh, Christian school, and and one of your teachers was um, was real strong in apologetics, right? And so, uh, given given some of the conversations you had with him, um, how can you logically like reason that God's word would be true versus just like that's all that's what I've been raised with, that's what I've been told? Like, what are some of the explanations that he gave to help explain the Bible to be true? So I think that um, just kind of like with the evidences like in the world that you can look at and cause that they can look back to prove that the Bible is true. Um, just like historical things that you can look at to prove it. I think just, there's a lot of things like that. And then like just um, looking at like the people that wrote it, like their lives, like what they went through to, you know, show that it was true, that what they believed really was true um, mm -hmm. and just like how um, how it's like it's one of the oldest like manuscripts we have out of like any other kind of like theological book that people have um, stuff, stuff like that I think is one way to kind of just try to um, bolster your faith I guess that what you believe in is true um, I, but for me I think a lot of it was because of like kind of like how Tom was how this is kind of all you've known or you know that's how you were raised and stuff like that until I really have sat down to a question is this true? You know, a lot of has just been my faith that you know what I believe in is true. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's going to be the uh, the number one uh, struggle that any person has in becoming a Christian is coming to a place of uh, more than just believing and more than just being like, well, I have the faith and I believe that the Bible is true, but coming to a place where you you study your Bible and you know your Bible and, and like you said the evidence that points to the Bible to know um, of the absolute truth that it really does contain it. and you know and like Krista um, it's not an overnight thing it's a lifelong journey you know like because some things are easier to grasp than others and I think especially in a world with so much information overload I mean it's just information overload non-stop um, and even within people that believe the Bible uh, it, within Christian communities that believe the Bible there's so much debate over whose interpretation is right and how do you explain this and how do you explain that um, but the reality is is and this is why I like to tell people about the Bible when it comes to the relevancy of its truth that it contains is is that there is elements of faith that are needed to to even you know, be in God's Word. Uh, but the reality is, is that God's Word uh, was never meant to be an end-all. You know, if you look at other religions around the world, um, they, it was, their, their holy books is the end-all. Like, you know, you have, you have just their Muslims and Buddhists and, you know, other world religions, their holy book is the end-all. Like, if you get this book right, then you're good. And um, the reality is, is that in Christianity, that's what, not what that is at all. Um, the Bible uh, is actually a revelation from God to us to point us to God. And so it's, the, it's a catalyst to draw us closer to God. It's a catalyst to help us understand more about who God is. And so it's not as much um, that the, the words on the page are being true, but it's that the spirit of the one who gave those words are true. And I think that's what um, we get so lost in because we get so caught up in debating about words and debating about phrases and debating, debating about original languages that we lose track of um, you know, who it is that the Bible is pointing to, who it is that the revelation of this word is from, and how it can draw us closer to him. And so we got the, in our verse, we got uh, the word of God being alive and active uh, we got the Word of God being a divider of what is true and what is false. Um, and then finally it talks about that the Word of God is a judge uh, that judges the attitudes and the thoughts of our hearts. And I actually preached on this uh, last Sunday and, and I, was, I was explaining it in this way that the heart, not our physical blood pumping heart, but our emotional heart, our soul, uh, that's where our attitudes come from. Our emotions are where our attitudes come from. And every attitude starts to produce thoughts within us. 
and every thought starts to produce words and actions. And so I was trying to explain this to some little kids at one point, and, and I said, so if your attitude is, is mad, and you start having mad thoughts, it's gonna come out on your face, so show me a mad face. And all these little kids were making mad faces. Yeah, it looked just like that. And um, they had, uh, and so we were just talking about that. And, and as I was explaining to them, the Bible is a judge over the attitudes and the thoughts of our heart. Because a lot of times, um, and the Bible says this, our hearts will actually lie to us. Like we'll have um, these emotional surges and we feel a certain way. And it may be completely irrational. Our emotions can be completely illogical in the circumstance, but because we feel a certain way about something, it'll create an attitude in us, and that attitude will create thoughts, and those thoughts will create actions. And so I can tell you, even in my marriage, or even with my kids, with my children, there'll be a certain circumstance or a certain situation, and I'll feel, you know, let's say like with my kids, they, they do something, and uh, it was innocent, it was an accident, but it made me angry. And so I'll feel angry about it. And my, my attitude of anger will turn into thoughts of anger. Like, oh, you kids, I can't believe you did that. You know, and at one and two, they very rarely do anything on purpose, right? And, um, but in my mind, I'm thinking, you did this on purpose. You did this just to make me angry. And, and all of these ideas um, start turning into action. And so instead of just being, oh, it's okay, it was an accident, let's clean it up. I'm like, everybody's in timeout. Everybody's sitting down. One minute for each year of age. Sit down now at the timeout bench. And, and so it's, it just turns into irrationality through and through. And so for the Word of God to be a judge of our hearts, or of the attitudes and the thoughts of our hearts, means in that moment, if I would have just took a minute and begin to think, what have I learned from God's Word about situations like this? And then the Word would be able to judge my attitude, my initial anger. Um, and then the Bible says, be slow to become angry. Alright? And um, be slow to speak. And so I could have taken that Word that comes from the Bible, internalized it in a split second, and allowed it to judge my heart and be like, okay, be slow to be angry. And then understand that, that the attitude will then adjust my thoughts. Okay, it was just an accident, no big deal. And then allow my actions to be more grace-filled and more merciful. And, and I say that to say that, um, you know, the, oftentimes our hearts need that kind of judge. Because if we were left to our own devices, if, and we can see that in our society a lot, whatever feels good, do it. And, and it's creating a whole bunch of mess. And so if, if, we, if we know that the Bible is living and active and is relevant for today, and if we know that it discerns truth, what is true from what is false, then um, and it, it's a judge over the attitudes and the thoughts of our heart and mind, um, then my question is this, how do we begin to, um, how do we begin to trust that those judgments are right? That those judgments are gonna lead us um, into what is, what is good and freeing, lead us into freedom versus what is like, I don't know, almost like slavery or bondage. You know, to be honest with you, anger is a bondage. There's nothing good that comes out of being just like, you know, outbursts of anger because your kids do something crazy or because your boyfriend or girlfriend does something crazy. And there's nothing good that comes out of anger when somebody, you know, messes with you and you're just like, Wah. So how can I trust that the Bible is going to judge me in the right direction, lead me in the right direction? Faith. Faith. Like that's like really simple, but we were talking about earlier about how like for you guys like the Bible is true, like that's what you've grown up with. Like I was growing up like, you have a problem? Go to the Bible, 
kind of see what it says. And then, I mean, it's still my interpretation of kind of what it says, but it'll lead you in the right direction. And if it doesn't, or you don't think it's in the right direction, you don't know what's happening in your life, really. Like, he does, so mm -hmm. he'll guide you. Well, so what you're, you're basically saying is give it a try. Yeah. Try it out and, and see what it does. Mm -hmm. and, I th and I think, too, like when you read, let's say it was anger, mm -hmm. and you go and you start reading up about anger. Well, usually, uh, whatever the topic is, whatever you're reading about, tends to be pretty obvious, right? Like, it's, it's pretty obvious what you should do with anger, what the Bible says to do with anger. Um, and, and it's pretty obvious of what the Bible says to do with work, you know? That's good. So what else do you do? How do you know that God's Word is going to lead you in the right thing instead of, you know, leading you astray in something you don't want to go in? I don't know, because even um, though the Bible is so clear on how to deal with anger or whatever, it's it still boils down to whether I'm going to choose to deal with it in that way or whether I'm going to choose to do my own thing. Um, so I, I guess to me, it's very obvious that if I will choose um, to deal with it how God tells me to through his word, um, that the outcome will be the best. Um, but the bigger issue for me is whether I'm going to make that choice or not. Yeah. And I very rarely consciously think, oh, I'm not going to deal with this anger the way God wants me to. It just, just kind of happens. Um, it's not that I deliberately choose not to. I realized like 30 seconds after I didn't <laughs> that, well, I just blew off the handle. Yeah. Um, Okay, that was cool. Yeah. So that didn't really answer your question. No, I, I like it. The... Good answer. So what do you do if you don't like what God says about your situation? Like you feel like you want to be angry and you don't like what God's word says about being angry. It's, it's hard. It really is. Like, I mean, it's still kind of like what they're saying. I mean, you, just, you have to try to still do it, even though it's not what you are wanting to do. But and it's like you have to have faith, but it's that God is doing the right thing for your life, that He knows what's better for your life than probably you do. But it's, it's still, in the moment, it's not easy to do that at all. It's true. Well, in closing, I just want to say this, that in your pursuit uh, to understand and to know God's Word and to really figure out for yourself, and even for you, the viewer, um, figuring out for yourself what it means to really uh, know and understand and believe and encounter God through His Word. Um, seeing it as living and active. Seeing it as um, a divider of what is true and what is false. And, and seeing it as a judge that judges the hearts and or the thoughts and the attitudes of our, th of our hearts. Um, in your pursuit of that, I want to encourage you to do two things. And, and I kind of mentioned it with Carissa is I want you to first of all, as you read, I want you to first of all look for what is obvious. Um, because a lot of times people will tell you that the Word of God is, is, is almost like, I, I referred to it in my sermon as the National Treasure, the movie with Nicolas Cage. Like there's all these hidden secrets um, in our nation and you have to go and un unlock certain codes and pieces of paper and in certain buildings and pull out bricks and and all this stuff and if you do all the right little things and find all the right little clues then you'll find the big treasure and it's really not the Word of God that's not how it is with God's Word um, how it is 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 when we start to read it I want to encourage you uh, start looking for what is obvious what is obvious about what you're reading about what is obvious about what God is saying about this uh, this topic or this circumstance or this situation you know be it money be it relationships be it whatever what is obvious? What is God obviously saying about that? Um, secondly is this. As you figure out what God is saying, what's obvious about what God is saying, start to focus on what is emphasized in the Word about what He's saying. And that's going to be uh, the direct steps that you begin to take to live out um, the, the truth that you find in God's words. And so if it's a relationship, um, what's obvious about what God is saying about relationships, so what specifically is being emphasized on how you should live that out in your life? And when you begin to focus on what is obvious, and you begin to focus on what is emphasized, um, God's Word is going to lead you uh, down a path that is going to be for your benefit. 
um, because Jeremiah 29 11, the scripture tells us uh, that, that God knows the plans that he has for us, the plans that are going to prosper us and not harm us, the plans to give us hope and give us a future. And, and those are the kind of things that we are looking for um, in this life. And God has them, and he has them in the truth of his word. And his word is going to not just be the end all, but it's going to lead you closer to God himself. And God's word tells us when we seek him, we will find him, when we seek him with all of our hearts. So start by seeking him in his word. Look for what is obvious and focus on what is emphasized. And I promise you, you will not be disappointed in those pursuits. So this is another week of Ragamuffin. You guys have any closing thoughts or statements? Okay. Until next time, God bless and we'll see you then.